Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today I want to talk about methodology. What is it that Muslims need to be doing? Should we be doing jihad? Should we be doing sabr? When should we be doing jihad? When should we be doing sabr? What was the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ? What conditions does Quran lay down for doing jihad? And really, what is the step-by-step -step process? Now, I want to explain this to you in a proper way so that, you know, so that, you know, I really like making my videos, I want to make my videos short, but it's like, if I want to explain things properly, then it takes time. So, I'm going to explain a few things today, and then we'll see how it goes, inshallah. The first thing I want to explain is that there, the deen, deen islam has different parts to it, and these different parts, different rules apply to them. Let me give you an example. Sharia has a set of rules, and those rules apply to Sharia. Dream interpretation is something completely different, and a different set of rules apply for dream interpretation. In the same way, you have Ilmul Akhiru Zaman, which has a different set of rules. In the same way, you have Tazkiyatun Nafs, Ikhlaq, Adab, or other Islamic etiquettes and mannerisms and purification of the soul, this has a different set of rules. Let me just be clear on what I mean. For example, in Sharia, we know if it's an issue of ibadah, an issue of ibadah, then you have to do it exactly the way the Prophet did it. When it's an issue of ibadah, generally, there's no question about it, you have to do copy and paste. You have to do it the way the Prophet did it in the way the Prophet told us to do it. When it is an issue of mu'amalat, dealing with other human beings, then everything is halal unless it's haram. Like eating food, everything is halal except what is haram. This is within the category of sharia. In dream interpretation, you have ta'wilul ahadith. You look at how in the world of, of, of parables, in the world of analogies, or allegories, what does something represent? So, for example, a good tree represents something good. In the Quran, if somebody cries, it's considered good, right? So, the dream interpretation it has a certain rules. Like, for example, having a dream uh, after Fajr versus a dream before Fajr it has its own set of rules. Dream interpretation. In the same way, ikhlaq and tazkiyatun nafs. For example, somebody feels like I want to do a lot of ibadah. Right? Let's say he feels like I want to do pray 100 rakah. Today night, I want to pray 100 rakah. Well, he, some, the teacher may tell him or the sheikh may tell him, look, don't pray 100. You, I understand you're very motivated, but pray only 80 or pray only 50. So, and then do something smaller, but consistently, because if something is smaller and consistent over time, that becomes bigger. Somebody does 100 rakah at night, and one time he does it, versus let's say he's doing 10 rakah for, for three years, or he's doing two rakah for three years, will be more. So, uh, there is a way to look at the issues of tazkiyatun nafs, that has its own rules. In the same way, when it comes to da'wan jihad, when the Prophet was in Mecca, how was he uh, doing his work? When it changed to jihad, and what is legitimate jihad? All these issues, they have their own rules. Okay? So now that I explain this. So, Sharia has its own rules. Da'wan jihad has its own rules. Even though all this fits under deen. Okay? All of this fits under deen. And under deen, there are different categories. And these different categories have different rules. So we're going to now look specifically at Da'wan jihad and some aspects of Sharia where they meet. Okay. Number one. The word used in Quran for qital, by the word, by the way, in Quran, the word jihad is a general term that's even used in the Quran for non-Muslims. Anyone that struggles, 
There are different Quranic terms for the word struggle. Sa'a is another uh, word that means struggle. There are other words too, but I'm not going gonna, gonna to try to make this concise. The word kutiba, kutiba alaykum siyam fasting has been ordained for you, it's been written for you. And inna salata kana ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta, prayer times have been written for the believers. Kutiba alaykum al-qital, fighting, fighting, war has been prescribed for you. When the word, when something is made for the, by the word kataba, kutiba, kitaban, right, it's been written for you, usually, usually, they come with conditions. And a very important point. Salah has its conditions, has to be the right time, you have to have wudu, you have to be facing the qibla, it comes with conditions. Same thing with fasting in Ramadan, kutiba alaykum as siyam fasting has been written to you, has to have a certain time, right? And a certain uh, structure to that, certain conditions need to be met for that to be valid. The same word is used for qital. Kutiba alaykum al qital. Qital is not something that can be done haphazard or just creating havoc in society or chaos in society or just an, an individual or a group of friends going and they're going to now change the world and be a hero to the world. It doesn't work like this. This is serious, serious business. So, that's the first. So this is the second point. The first point is that deen has different aspects with different rules and jihad and da'wah is one of them. I'll share with you something very interesting about this. The sahabi who was chosen to go to Medina and do da'wah to them by which they became then Muslims enough that they would invite the Prophet to Medina. His name is Musa bin Umair radiallahu anh. He is the one who was, the Prophet sent him on his behalf to Medina. And what he would do is, he would recite Quran. And Khalid bin Walid became, you know, the sim the the iconic person of jihad. What's interesting is their graves are together. Musa bin Umair radiallahu an and Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an, their graves are one side by side. So these two things are part of one whole da'wah and then jihad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Imran, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this process, okay? That there's a process you have to go through. فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ إِنِّي لَا أُضِيُّ عَمَلْ عَامِلٍ مِّنْكُمْ مِّنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَىٰ Allah says, I will not put to the waste of any good deed of any good person. فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ إِنِّي لَا أُضِيُّ عَمَلْ عَامِلٍ مِّنْكُمْ مِّنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَىٰ Whether it be male or female. So then Allah says, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ إِنِّي لَا أُضِيُّ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِّنْكُمْ مِنْ ذَكْرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَىٰ بَعْدُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدٍ فَالَّذِينَ حَاجَرُوا وَأُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ Those people who did hijrah and they were kicked out of their houses. وَأُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأُوذُوا فِي سَبِيلِ And they suffered pain in my cause. وَأُوذُوا فِي سَبِيلِ وَقَاتَلُوا وَقُتِلُوا They killed and they were killed. وَقَاتَلُوا وَقُتِلُوا لَا أُكَفِّرْ عَنَّا عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ We will definitely cover them from their faults. But this is a process. From da'wah to hijrah to qital, this is a process that needs to take place. So, what are some of the conditions of jihad? Let me start with that, then I'll talk about the stage of sabr, so it becomes clear. Now, I know maybe, you know, at some point, some... FBI or some person who doesn't like me is going to see this video. So I want to make it clear. This is my disclaimer that I have to give here. So it's very clear. You know, uh, look, I'm not talking about killing innocent people. I'm not talking about uh, violating human rights. I'm not talking about doing anything injustice. I'm talking about a people, a civilization, that when they are being put into an ethnic genocide what they should do should they be patient and trust in god and wait or should they stand up for their rights should they stand up for their rights and risk their necks or should they let the genocide happen to them this is the question that i am dealing with i'm not talking about uh you know somebody uh going into a bar because he's angry at 
people drinking alcohol and shooting them all down. I'm not talking about that. Islam does not believe in killing uh, civilians. It does not believe in killing innocent people. We don't even believe in collateral damage. We don't even want collateral damage. Okay, so am I clear about this? So, you know, I just, just want to be very clear because uh, people have a knack or have specialties of twisting people's words and making it into something that it is not. So now, you see, the Muslims, they want to do the things the Islamic government needs to do. Our job is not to do the things the Islamic government would do. Our job is to do the things that we have to do. So what is that we have to? We have to establish Islam. We have to establish an Islamic society. Then the Islamic society, the Islamic government will help the people that are persecuted. It will bring them the 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 army if necessary. It will bring them the the uh, the the relief, the funds, the support, the food, the blankets, the shelter, the uh, the, the the relief will come from a government. It is the government's job to how how can Muslims individuals prioritize, organize, get everything done when we're dealing with Muslims of Burma, Muslims of China, Muslims of Kashmir, Muslims of Palestine. How can this be done individual? Our job is not to send blankets to Kashmir or blankets to Gaza or blankets to some place. Our job is to establish the deen of Allah and then have the right people whose, whose job it will be to get these things done on behalf of the rest of the Muslims. There is, there is two things, two things. If you are living in a place and Islam is not established there, and you are thinking you're going to help the Muslims of Kashmir, and you're going to help the Muslims of Palestine, and you're going to help the Muslims of Yemen, and you're going to help the Muslims of China, you're delusional. Delusional. There are two phases to this jihad. The jihad itself, there are two phases. Oh, I was saying that even the word jihad is used for non-Muslims. This is in Surah Al-Luqman, for example. وَإِن جَاهَدَكَ أَن تُشْرِكْ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ If they do jihad against you, meaning the parents, against you, regarding for which you have no knowledge, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Don't obey them. Follow the one who calls to more, my path. Then I will tell you of the things that you are doing. There is the struggle to bring Islam. There is the struggle to bring the Islam into Yemen or into Saudi Arabia, overthrow the kingship or overthrow the kingships in other places, or to bring Islam in Pakistan, or to bring Islam in Kashmir. There is the struggle to bring Islam within. That's one jihad. But we're going to talk about that. Because that requires a special ijtihad at this time, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And then once the Islamic State has been established, if 3,000 Americans are killed, then there is a government that will stand up for them and attack. If there was no government, you can have your remorse and your eulogies and your, you know, write your books and give your speeches. Nothing will happen. What can we do? What can I do? What can you do for the people in Burma or in China or for Yemen or for Syria or for Palestine or for Kashmir? Mean you can't do anything. We need the proper institutions to do that. This is why there was the, the Khalifa, the Amir, and then there was the Amir of Jaish, the Amir of the army. Our job is to establish that army that will do that job. Now, how do we bring Islam into a particular place? 
This is requires a longer discussion. This point. How do you bring Islam from within? Like if you are a Muslim in Pakistan or you're Muslim in Malaysia or you're Muslim in Indonesia, how do you bring Islam into that land? If there were no standing armies, actually let me make this clear by showing you the verses of Quran that I will use to show you the conditions. But the basic condition is there has to be a jama'ah. It has to be a sizable jama'ah. It has to be, it has to have done the da'wah of Islam that enough people are convinced of Islam and want Islam. Like that lady when she did zina. And she went to the Prophet and said, I did zina, give me the hug. People are at that, enough people, not everyone. But a critical mass is at that level where they want us, they've been convinced, they have been convinced and they want Islam. If you will bring Islam or any government and the people are not convinced of it, it will be a failed project and it will be easy for the enemies of Islam to make it a failed project. You have to convince the masses, especially some people amongst the elite like Abu Bakr and Khatija and Uthman and, and all the other people, Talha and Zubair, all these people are the elite of their society. They have to be convinced intellectually that this is, this is the way to go. You have to break off a piece of their intellectual group and be able to convince them this is the way to go. This is from within I'm talking. Okay? To make that change, you need an emir, you need a, you need a jama, you need the shura, and what? You have to have a sizable number with you. Let me give you a historical example. We all know that when Muawiyah radiallahu an, he became, when he was the khalifa and he passed away and Yazid after that became the leader. And when Hussein radiallahu anh saw this change, this fundamental, very basic change in Islam from Khilafa and from a government based upon Shura, he saw this change from a government based upon Shura to a government of Malukiya, kingship. He stood up. He said, no. He said that his attitude was the same as when Abu Bakr heard, people don't want to give zakat. Are you, are you, are you, wa you want to change the deen and I'm alive? How can this happen? So when Hussein radiallahu anh saw this very fundamental change that now Islam is about to change from Khilafah to Mulukiyah, from Khilafah to kingship, he stood up, and we know what happened. Radi Allahu an. But it didn't end there. People don't know the history. After that, there was a series of events. One of those events happened at the time of Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa. There was a man from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. They used to call him Nafsu Zakiya, purified soul. His name was also Muhammad bin Abdullah. His name was Muhammad bin Abdullah. He stood up and he wanted to challenge the Umayyad Empire. He wanted to challenge the Umayyad Empire. And what happened? He wanted to challenge Nafsu Zakiya, Muhammad bin Abdullah wanted to challenge the Umayyad Empire. When he stood up and he and Abu Hanifa said this statement, he said today is like the battle of Badr. And Imam Malik gave his very famous fatwa, La bayun fi jabr, for which his hands were cut off. La bayun fi jabr. This bayah you have with the Khalifa, this allegiance you have with the Khalifa, it is not valid because it's under compulsion. Give your bayah to Muhammad bin Abdullah. Even though both Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik didn't give their bayah to him. But Imam Abu Hanifa did send money. And Imam Malik gave the fatwa. They got utterly destroyed. They got utterly destroyed. This is where Imam Abu Hanifa gave his, I think, historical fatwa. He said, 
if you're going to do an uprising. At least let it be plausible that if you do an uprising, you're going to win. Your numbers have to be substantial. It shouldn't be 300 versus 100,000. And this is also proven from the Quran. The Quran men mentions this point. Let me just show you very quickly. The numbers that are with the Jama'ah, with the Amir, is important. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها النبي حرد المؤمنين على القتال O oh, oh, Prophet of Allah, encourage the believers towards war. Because if there's a war against you, and this is very clear that the war, Allah, they started against you the first time. Muslims are not going to that are going to, they are going to wrong us and we will then respond. Then what does Allah say? وَإِن يَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أَشْرُونَ صَابِرُونَ تَخْلِبُوا مِئَتَيْنِ If there are 20 amongst you that are sub, that have sabr, تَخْلِبُوا مِئَتَيْنِ You will overcome 200. وَإِن يَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ مِئَةٌ And if there's a hundred of you, تَخْلِبُوا ألف. You will overcome a thousand. This is the number. One to ten. If you are sabr, you have a very strong iman, and you have sabr, Allah will help you in the ratio of 1 to even 10. مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِأَنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ This is because they are a people who do not understand. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but if your iman is weak, الْآنْ خَفَّفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكُمْ وَعَلِمَ أَنَّكُمْ فِي أَنَّ فِيكُمْ دُعْفَ Allah has lightened the burden for you because Allah knows your iman is now weak. There's amongst you, amongst you, there are people who are weak. But if you have a hundred that have sabr, you will now overcome because your iman is weak, you'll overcome two hundred. And if you have a thousand, you will overcome or a number of two thousand. Allah, by the permission of Allah. Wallahu Allah is with those people who do sabr. So the point here is that it's not just haphazard. It has to be institutionalized. It okay, so before it's institutional, to bring the Islamic government, we're going to talk about that. But once it is institutionalized, even then you need good numbers. You can't just go and start fighting with somebody that has a thousand times more power than you. It doesn't work. This is not the Sunnah of Allah. This is not how Allah does things. And so, then, now, what about internally? Internally, you have to have a jama'ah, you have to convince the people, you have to clear their ideologies, you have to clear their mind, you have to win the intellectuals and the elite on your side, you have to convince them Islam is the way to go, and when you have a critical mass amongst them, only then you can bring an internal change. Once that internal change has been made, now what, what is the problem with that? Because now we know there's a condition in terms of numbers and powers. Because if in Badr there were 313 on one side, there was a thousand on the other side. And these were the best Sahaba in the world. The people that Allah has forgiven, whatever they do afterwards, they're forgiven. So 313 of those were overcame a thousand clear. But when Islam became weak and the hypocrites became part of Islam, we lost in the Battle of Badr. So this is something very important to keep in mind. You have to convince the others. Now, in the modern nation-state situation, in the modern nation-state situation, listen to this very carefully, where you have standing armies, trained armies, they have the arms, they have the bigger weapons, the civilians, how are they going to win the army? How are they going to win the army? They can't win the army. They can't. But what you can do is civil disobedience, which is what Makkah teaches us. You can stand up and say, we will die. We can't beat you, but we will die. We're not going to let this happen. And the army is built 
to defend itself from outsiders, not its own civilians. The army will have to, after killing 500,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 of its own people, it'll have to surrender. Because the army cannot kill its own people forever. And in this is a great lesson. So you have to first bring Islam. So block the system. Say, we will not let you move until you establish these laws of Allah. Bring the army, let them kill us. Because you can only go far as far as Sharia will allow you to. You don't have the conditions met to do jihad, convince the people. Have them stand up. When you have enough people to block the system, but you don't have enough yet to fight them because you don't have the paramilitary, you don't have the commandos, you don't have the, 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 any of the institutions that are used for fighting a proper war, then your job is to block the system, block the roads, and let the army shoot you. Stand in front of the tanks. Let them shoot you, but don't retaliate. This is what the Prophet said. Keep your hands tied, do not retaliate. Take all persecution, do not retaliate. When Umar bin Khattab was in Mecca, and Yasir and Sumayya were being killed, or Khibab bin Ard was being tortured, where was Umar? Where was the Jalal of Umar? Where was the Jalal of Hamza? Because the Prophet said, take all persecution. There, so this is how you deal with the internal situation. Then when you have enough people, Block the system. What happened in Iran is a good example of this. What Gandhi did in, in India is a good example of this. Khomeini gave a fatwa, it's haram to stay inside the houses. The Shah of Iran, he said, it's, you have, there's curfew, you can't leave the houses. The people that came out, army started shooting. But army is going to shoot how many of its own people? 500, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. The army laid down its weapons. Gave the gave the 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 hukuma, the leadership to the alternate. First, you have to bring Islam within your land. Then that land now has to do stand up for Muslims and Islam and fight for the cause. Now the question is: Should we do sabr or should we fight? Is there an emir? Is there a jamaa? Do they have bayah? Are they purified? Are they willing to lay down their lives? Are they going to disobey the Amir because they disagree with him? Are their own egos at some point shaitan is going to take advantage of their own egos and make them split? It could be more than one jama'ah. And over here I want to make one point. One brother raised this that, oh, you know, I talk about having different jama'ahs and different, but that's kind of like splitting it. No. There's a difference between having a jama'ah and organizations for a certain goal in the future versus having an organization based upon some mazhab or aqidah or some label that we usually fight over. Those are over, you know, people of the past and ideas of the past. This is not an I this is a goal. I want to reach a certain goal, I will adapt one way. Maybe another brother, he has some slight differences with me, but he has the same goal. This is why you find, for example, Ikhwan al-Muslimin and Jamaat islami they don't, they don't have any problems with each other, even though they're different Jamaas, but they have the same goal. Hizbut Tahrir, Tanzim islami so on and so forth, uh, these groups, they have the same goal. So they, they appreciate one another. Uh, Al-Murabitun, they appreciate one another. Oh, he's working for the same goal. He's working for Khilaf. Okay. We have different opinions. We can argue over this, but at least we have the same goal. Every Muslim should be part of some jama'at to first establish Islam in his area, in his place, in his country. Have an amid, give the bayah, have the shura. If they meet conditions of... And then, if they have the strength, Allah gives them the strength. They can block the system. They can bring the deen of Allah. Then they should. Then that country will then do the work of Islam. That place will do the work of Islam. This is the process the Prophet went. In Mecca, the Prophet's doing street preaching, doing da'wah, doing da'wah, doing da'wah, doing da'wah. But da'wah was so clear. 
and because the prophets do not retaliate and the Muslims took all persecution when they were there in Badr and they saw who's on that side Abu Bakr who's on our side Abu Lahab Abu Jahal these people are on our side and over there is Abu, Abu Bakr the one who used to help the poor people these are the people that we were persecuting for no reason they didn't have the more the, 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 the moral fiber the moral substance to fight against them that's what sabr does and over here is something very important how do we take advantage because you know that was a small place like a, a, almost as small as the city campus Makkah was small so when Muslims were being persecuted, everybody knew about it. Our job is when we are being persecuted, it gets documented and circulated everywhere because that creates public opinion. That becomes very important that when you stand up for yourself and then you have, look, look at this, what they did to us. Do you remember that picture that became viral where a Palestinian father was trying to protect his son and then the, the, the little boy, he got shot. Everybody remembers that. That uh, child that died, I think there was a Russian attack in Syria. That picture went everywhere. It's very important, very, very important. When you're in the state of sabr, let them persecute you. And the Prophet said, and over here there's also one thing that I want to share with you, very important. And that is the Prophet, there's one thing, if, you're, uh, if a Muslim is trying to kill a Muslim, in this the preference is, when a Muslim is killing, going to kill another Muslim, then the Muslim, he can. Man duna mali fahuwa shaheed, the Prophet said. Whoever dies protecting his wealth is shaheed. But when it comes to the movement of da'wah and jihad to establish the deen of Allah, then it is better in certain circumstances, like in the case of Uthman and others, it's better to take the persecution. To, let them kill you. Don't fight back. And there's a hadith of the Prophet, and I don't remember the source right now, but there's a hadith of the Prophet specifically about Syria. That when Muslims come against you with weapons, don't raise weapons against them, even if it means you're going to be killed. So, there is, you are in the state of sabr, in the state of da'wah, until you have a critical mass. Your, our job is not to provide blankets and relief and food for the Muslims that are suffering, as we have so many relief organizations doing. It's not our job. This is the job of the Islamic government. I'm sorry to say, but that's not our job. Our job is to work to establish the deen of Allah. Then the deen, then once the deen of Allah is established, then we have a system in place, zakat and so on and so forth and sadaqat. Then the government will in a proper way, in an institutionalized way, in a proper priority with proper committees and proper proper funding and proper resources and proper technology, it will be able to then prioritize things and do things accordingly. So, we have to establish the deen of Allah. Once the deen of Allah, and, and that is a process of sabr. When these nation states fall, which they will fall, when these nation states fall, and there's no more standing army, and no more trained pillar, uh, paratroopers and commandos and none of these things, like in the time of Mahdi, which will be very soon, I think in one or two generations, maybe. When that time comes and all the nation states have fallen, and there'll be no passports and people from Iraq can go to the Mahdi, as the Prophet mentions, and people from Syria will go to the Mahdi, as the Prophet mentions, there'll be no, nobody looking at passports. Then again, at that time, if you have a jama, if you have an amir, if you have a shura, then, you, then, then, and if at that time there's no standing army, and there are volunteers on this side and volunteers on that side, and then at that time jihad can be done in the form of a jama with swords or whatever uh, technology that people may have. But if there's no standing army, if as long as there's a standing army. Muslims don't have a chance. Civilian Muslims have no chance of bringing an Islamic state or an Islamic government via jihad. It's not going to happen. Now, I gave you the numbers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. 20 to 200. 100, 100, uh, 
1,000 to 2,000, and if you're weak, double, one to two, right? There's another hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that is very interesting in this subject. And the Prophet said وسلم, La, Twelve, a number of 12,000 will not be defeated because of lack of numbers. You may be defeated because people inside your group got changed because of the egoism within, because of the lack of discipline within. But you won't be defeated because of lack of numbers from 12,000. That's what the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. لَنْ يَغْلِبُ مِنَ الْقِلَّةِ إِثْنَةَ عَشْرَةَ مِنَ الْقِلَّةِ 12,000 people will not be destroyed because of lack of numbers. So the minimum every jama'ah should try to reach. And we should have more and more of these jama'ahs. Everywhere. Because if they stop one jama'ah, they can't stop another jama'ah. There, there should be as many of these jama'ahs in, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Nigeria, in every place of the Muslim world, in Somalia, in, 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 in all parts of the world, in Egypt, in every place there should be jama'ahs standing up to establish the deen of Allah. To teach people, this is what the Islamic system looks like. This is what the Islamic just system looks like. This is the way to freedom for us. Only when this has been made clear at the mass level, then when the Mahdi comes, people will wreck all the jamaas, all the jamaas that are working on their own in different places, then we have now a s system of coming together. Now it's the time to now. Now I was working in my area, but now it's the time to go and do hijrah. Okay? So I'll end here today on this issue. Again, I want to be clear. The disclaimer needs to be clear. Everybody needs to be clear that I'm not talking about killing civilians. I'm talking about establishing an Islamic government that will then st help stop the genocide that is around the world. I'm saying that we cannot, as individuals, do the work of the Islamic government. We need to have a jama'ah, an amir, a bayah, a shura. We need to all join. Whoever dies and they don't have bayah, the prophet died jahiliya. The prophet said, you have to be in a jama'ah. And if you're not in a jama'ah, this is hadith of Tirmazi. Even if you are praying and fasting, and I'm not saying this is the case for all of us who are not in a jama'ah. But if you're not praying, you're not, if you're praying and fasting and not in a jama'ah, well, the Prophet says, the Prophet said, it's not accepted. I mean, that's not the, the shar' of the hadith itself. But it is dangerous. Alaykum, you know, alaykum bil jama'ah, the Prophet. Yadullahi fawqal. The help of Allah comes when there's a jama'ah, when there's an amir, when you're able to cry, because the amir is human, and he's going to make a lot of mistakes. He'll make a lot of silly mistakes. And every person in the Jama'ah is going to think, I can be better than that Amir. And you're going to have to crush your ego because the unity, the unity is more important than, than any great idea that our egos can come up with. So anyway, I will end here for today. So are we, should we be in a state of sabr? Well, the question is, do we meet the conditions of jihad? As long as we don't meet the conditions of jihad, go fu aidiyakum, keep your hands tied, take all persecution, and there's a great reward for this persecution, which I will, inshallah, talk about at another time. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like. And make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I just wanted to add a few things uh, just to make them clear. So, first of all, when I say our job is not to send blankets to Kashmir, I don't mean literally our If we have the opportunity or we can help a relief organization send blankets to Kashmir or anywhere else in the world to help the Muslims, we should do that. There's no question about that. It's a good deed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward anyone who's going to do that. But that is sadaqah. The status of that is sadaqah. But the work to establish an aqimu al wa la tatafarraku fi to establish the deen of Allah, that is fard. Number one. Number two. The jama'ah 
that is working to establish the deen of Allah. There are two things a jama'ah has to do simultaneously. I want this to be very clear. Okay? One is a correct idea of Shaykh Imran Hussain, and one is a correct idea of Dr. Israr Ahmed. I'm combining the two. The correct idea of Shaykh Imran Hussain is, basically you need to get off the grid, because this economy is going to fall, and this paper money is going to be worth nothing, except maybe even less than paper itself. And so this is, you have to be off the grid, so Jassasa, the Jasus, the Jassasa of the Jal, the spying ability, the one, the eye of the Jal will not be over you. You have to get out of the grid. Find ways of communication that are outside the grid. That would be ideal. But also, start growing your own food. Eat healthy food, not this food that makes us dumber. Real food. You know, uh, I know this imam, he only eats real food. I mean real food means he'll eat a grape or he'll eat an uh, apple. He's not going to eat something that even he, that is processed in any way, put together by machines in any way. He doesn't eat that. That's ideal. I don't do that. I'm not there yet. That's not my maqam yet. But the goal is to get off the grid. To establish a jama'ah so you can live off the grid. So you're not part of this Dijali system. So this is from Shaykh Imran Hussain. Then what I mentioned before, that you have to have a jama'ah to establish the deen of Allah, this is from Dr. Isra Ahmed. And the process of doing that from Dr. Isra Ahmed. So the jama'ah has two functions. Number one, getting off the grid and getting ready to do hijrah too the Mahdi. And number two, to establish a jama'ah, to establish the deen of Allah, so then you can have the teachings of Islam and the ideas of Islam. And, and to establish the deen means what? You have to go through that process of changing the hearts and the minds of the people so that a critical number is with you. So that it, it, enough critical people are with you, enough people are with you that it becomes a possibility to establish Islam. So a jama'ah has these two functions. Get off the grid and to establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, I also wanted this to be clear. Then once the deen of Allah is established, then it is on the khilafah and how they want to proceed forward from there.